touring bikes are designed to keep riders happy and fresh as they cover long distances, and modern touring rigs usually offer some pretty luxurious amenities. That's progress, baby. Right? Time marches on. Machinery becomes more specialized. Tailored options supplant generalist hardware. But do they also displace quaintness and elegant antiquity? The new for 2016 Indian Springfield says no. Nope. Indian calls this a beggar in their lineup, not a touring bike, but that's bunk. The Springfield is a touring bike, just like other baggers, dressers, garbage wagons, and whatever else you want to call bikes in this category. This is a motorcycle that contains all of the things needed to tour with and adds just enough extra frills to make a long trip easy, maybe like a touring mount from Indian's first heyday. This setup, hard bags and a windshield, is my favorite setup. It mimics the touring bikes of old, set up with Bucko or Bates hard bags and a nice protective windshield for the rider. That sort of style has always hung around as the minimalist touring setup. But bikes like that didn't used to be the low-key touring option. Instead, they were the only option. This Indian teleports you back to that time. Riding the Springfield I didn't have oodles of time on the Indian. It really amounted to just a few hours. I spent some time on good ol' I-95 in Florida, knocking down some miles between Orlando and St. Augustine, and I also took time to ride some slower two-lane state roads. I had never been to St. Augustine previously, but I do intend to go back. It was very picturesque. I rode a Springfield in Indian Motorcycle Red, which carries a $549 premium over the Thunder Black models that retail for $20,999. The bike looked and felt like the older tourers I tend to gravitate to, heavy, with the weight carried down low, and friendly, inviting controls. It should be noted, however, that the Springfield comes stock with no heel shifter. That didn't bug me, because I ride lots of non-touring motorcycles, but seasoned big bike people who miss it will want to order the bolt-on heel shifter, which can be easily added. Floorboards were large and generous, and the buckhorn style bars put my hands in a comfortable position that offered lots of control. Before I got on the bike, though, I had to just stop and take it all in. Whether you love this style or hate it, you cannot possibly mistake this bike for anything but an Indian. Gone are the days of the bottle cap engine or warmed over HD AVO engines masquerading as some perverse form of Indian. Much like Triumph's modern classics are visually unquestionably just Triumph, this baby is Indian all the way through. The most noticeable aspect of the Indian's ride is its propensity to tug. The bike simply thunders along, amassing velocity forcefully. I bet a cannonball rides like this, heavy and fast. The engine chugs right along and doesn't seem to want to be revved way out. Makes sense. It's got a massive stroke at nearly 4.5 inches. My Heine Dino gave me the impression that the torque chart for this bike looks like a contour map of Kansas, completely flat. When I'm out seeing the sights, I like to just motor along in the low end of the gear and let the engine do the lazy lope thing. The 111 cubic inch engine, called the Thunderstroke, was more than happy with that arrangement. It's cranking out 119.2 foot-pounds of torque at 3000 RPM, which is neck and neck with the big, air-cooled V-twin made by the other company. That TS111 is a mill with drop-dead gorgeous styling. Deeply fined heads, with the fins canted to the sides that overhang the jugs. Air cooling, of course. Downward facing exhaust pipes, just like an old side valve. And the triple cam setup means the push road tubes look exactly like flathead valve covers. This is an engine that screams Indian. Painstaking attention to styling detail carries over to the rest of the bike, too. The Ledwar bonnet on the fender is a cleverly modernized, immediately recognizable Indian feature. The mostly hidden dual front brake rotors are really unobtrusive, as are the cast wheels. Cast wheels seem like they'd be out of place on a classically styled bike, but there are good reasons for their existence. First, they allow tubeless tires to be plugged, 
not patched, which is a big undertaking on a bike of this size. More importantly, they allow the use of a tire pressure monitoring system TPMS. This isn't the go-slash-no-go -go type found on most automobiles. Instead, the rider actually has access to exact inflation pressures for front and rear wheels. This greatly simplifies one of motorcycling's most tedious chores, checking inflation. I love this touch. The seat was ample and comfy, and the floorboards were large and gave me room to move my feet around. Passenger floorboards are a nice touch, too. The wheelbase is 67 inches, so the chassis was long enough to really soak up the bumps. In full trim with fluids, the Springfield rings in at 852 pounds. Touring bikes are the only category where being overweight is not just acceptable, it's encouraged. That weight feels pretty damn good underneath you if you find yourself hammering past turnpike doubles in the crosswind. Handling and suspension are where I feel the Springfield shines. Knee pucks are obviously unnecessary when you're on a Springfield, but I must say, this bike got down and boogered in a corner far better than I would have assumed. On the straight roads of Florida, I didn't have the time or knowledge of my surroundings enough to go into full let's try and destroy it mode, but I didn't scrape a single part of the Springfield in what I would describe as spirited riding, a fact that makes me very pleased. The cornering clearance is no worse than a Harley Davidson, and I think it may actually be a bit better. As for the suspension. Wow! Just wow! This bike is plush. The rear is air adjustable, and the front is a conventional telescopic setup with 46mm tubes. If I owned a Springfield, I would play a bit with the air assist settings on the rear for solo and two up work, memorize the pressures, and then I would never touch it again. I can't fix this suspension, because there's nothing to fix. This is no small point. Consider that many of the folks who buy these are likely to be a bit older. Consider, too, that many pillions will be less and eager spouses. I cannot stress enough how big a blow this strikes to the road king. A luxe ride on a Turing machine sells the bike better than a salesman. Rounding things out is the stop in equipment. Triple four pot calipers squeeze a trifecta of 300mm brake rotors. Let's not beat around the bush, this is a lot of bike to slow down, but the tires and brakes are definitely up to the task. ABS worked as expected in the dry weather I experienced for the few hours I had with the bike. The ABS kicked in normally and worked fine in sand, pea gravel, and the tiny bit of mud I tested it in. As a side note, I bet the brakes would be ridiculously effective on a smaller bike. Maybe a sports scout?